Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 11. If you need a Bible, there should be one close by in the back of the seat. You're welcome to borrow that Bible. We want you to have it open as we study John chapter 11. If you need a Bible to take home with you, please don't take the one in the back of the seat, but we have plenty on the shelf right in the back, back here. Take as many of those as you want. Take them, read them, find someone to read them with you, even better. We just recited Ezekiel 37, the prophecy that God, by His Word and by His Spirit, raises His people out of their graves from the dead. And when He does so, He says that we are then to know that he alone is God and he is the Lord. And so we catch this, of course, right in the middle of this grand event being described to us in John 11 of the death of Lazarus and now his resurrection in verse 39. Well, let me just back up. Can I do that for a minute? I want to just back up and remind you that Martha said in verse 21, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And then Mary said in verse 32, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then some of the naysayers who were standing around watching Jesus weep said, could not he, this is verse 36, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have also kept this man from dying? Jesus had something better in mind, didn't he, than keeping him from dying. He's going to bring a dead man back to life. In verse 39, then Jesus deeply moved again or stirred to indignation again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there is an odor because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I'm saying this on account of the crowd standing around so that they might believe that you sent me. Now, having said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And the man who had died came out, still bound, his hands, his feet with linen strips, and his head or his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This is the word of God. Help us, Lord. Help me. I do not have any ability or sufficiency to do justice to who you are as you are revealing yourself through this event in history. But I pray that we might somehow by your grace be transported back, that we might be a part of that crowd standing around that would believe that you are the sent Son of God the very giver, author, owner, source of life. Death-defying life. Will you grant it to us by your Spirit in your word today, O oh God? And there might be some who are spiritually dead here right now. Will you call them out by name? save them and raise them today Lord Jesus for your glory and all God's people said Amen. 
was a year ago, a year and a week. Last Sunday, March 12th, 2022, a year ago, at about, I think, 8 a.m. ish, 8.30 a.m., I received news and began to sob in my office. And grieved and grieved. I think Alex came to my side. I, I think some of the other pastors came in. Maybe Dave, I can't remember who all people heard me. Uh, they came to me. I'd received news that the Lord had called my brother, my friend, and Brother Joe Nichols, home to be with the Lord. And the same day this year, March 12th of this year, the Lord called my sister and my friend, Sharon Buck, home to be with the Lord. Maybe you don't grieve the way I grieve. It's okay. I said last week, we don't have to insist that everybody grieves the same way or that everybody processes things the same way. I can tell you, I've had times where, well, in 2018, nine months after my dad's death, I took a sabbatical because I hadn't really had a chance, had an opportunity to grieve him much at all. I was too busy serving my family and the church and Things had to be done, and it was probably better for me that I waited. I finally took the sabbatical and knelt down on a hilltop in Casey County, Kentucky, at the foot of my dad's grave and heaved. I cannot describe to you the pain. I was in agony, heaving and groaning as if sick to my stomach, crying out loud, my voice echoing off the mountains, indignantly even. Maybe, you've no, maybe you don't do that. Maybe you don't grieve like that. You never have. It's, I'm not saying you have to. But I am quite certain that if you've lived any amount of time on this earth, something has hurt you so badly that you felt literally sick. Maybe you got sick. That you felt like, I, I, I can't even get a breath. I can't even breathe. That's pretty close to what John is describing to us is happening to the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. His humanity is definitely on display here, as is his divinity. He's fully on display for us. He's got all this emotion stirring, and he's stirred even, it says, to indignation, and he's deeply distressed. As he walks up to the tomb of his beloved friend, Lazarus. The whole scene, as John opens it up in verse 39, and 38 rather, and 39, it starts to scream something at us. The whole scene. And it screams one word, I think. Cursed. Cursed. Everywhere you look the curse. Jesus is looking around at evidence, reminders of the curse, these human creatures that he brought into existence by his own power, by his own word. He is the creator. The New Testament is clear on this. All things, John said, were made by him and without him was nothing made that was made. And so they have rebelled against God's goodness way back in the garden. And do you remember after Adam and Eve sinned and rebelled against God's good rule and reign, God begins to pronounce curses. Cursed are you, he said to the serpent. Pain upon you, he said to the woman. And then to the man, cursed is the ground. The whole creation is cursed because of you, he says to the man. And you were taken from the dust, and to dust you shall return. Cursed. This is not some witch's evil eye or some Disney magic trick. 
when El Shaddai curses you or curses anyone or anything, God Almighty, you are cursed. This is the scene around Jesus. Nothing so confirms the curse like death. God told Adam, in the day that you eat of that, you shall surely die. That's the English translation. It's literally in the Hebrew, dying you shall die. In other words, you shall enter the realm of being spiritually dead and cut off from me, and then one day you'll literally die. You're physically going to end. Dying, you shall die. The ground that Jesus is walking upon, cursed. As he walks and he weeps, and he weeps and he walks up to the tomb. And it's a cave, a cursed cave. There's a lot of symbolism in this event. I don't think that means the event didn't happen. It definitely is a real historical event. It happened, but there's a lot of symbolism in it as well. The cave speaks to us about death being dark. You know that about death? It's darkness. He comes up to a cave. Now, wealthy families in particular in uh, first century Palestine would have used uh, a lot of natural clays. It's like uh, Indiana. It's limestone country all over Israel. A lot of caves there naturally that they used as uh, tombs. Uh, and then if you're wealthy enough, you could have them carved out even in specific ways, of course, uh, to hold corpses. I've given you a couple pictures that I took while I was in Israel to help you see and remind you kind of what these tombs look like. So you might have an entrance like this. The entrance is um, usually you have to hunch over a little bit to get in it. They're not huge entrances, but they're big enough that two pallbearers could take a corpse in and out um, and deal with it. Uh, you can see the track here. The, the stone would have rolled in a track. The stone they built would roll. So it's about this high, pretty, pretty big. The slabs, some of them were arranged like the middle one here where you have slabs to put the bodies on. Other times they would go inside the cave and then dig, uh, scoop out little receptacles for the corpse. So these are the options. This is what the tombs still, still all over Israel. Many of them um, still exist like this. And it's pictures of a couple that we saw recently. But those are all nice and lit up and artificially, right? <laughs> no, 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 this is dark. Death is dark. The stones rolled over, John tells us. The stone would have kept larger creatures, larger animals out from getting in there. And Well, I don't need to say more than that. Uh, and it would have also, as Martha points out, trapped a lot of the odor. Because you see, inside that cursed cave was a cursed corpse. Verse 39, Jesus commands them, take the stone away. Now, I just want to pause here and say, it seems like to me in the uh, recounting of this whole event from John 11, verse 1, through what we're seeing now, it seems like the disciples have problems just obeying Jesus right away. Do you get that idea too? Remember back in verse 7 where he delayed for two days after he heard Lazarus was sick and then he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. And they essentially said, are you crazy? You lost your mind, Jesus. People were just trying to stone you. You're going back to the place where they wanted you dead? It seems like they have a problem. Just obeying Jesus right away. They call him Lord. Isn't it ironic? Martha calls him Lord. But then begins to try to be his counselor. Oh, but we never do anything like this. We, we don't have any of the same struggles or issues, right? I'm being facetious and sarcastic. Of course we do. If he's Lord, we should obey him right away. Lord, she says, and then she begins to counsel him. Don't you love it when we try to educate Jesus? 
as if Jesus didn't know. He's been in there four days and he stinketh. That's the King James and it cannot be improved upon here. The King James Version nails it. They say, Lord, by now he stinketh. Amen. Death, you see, is decay. It is dark and it is decay. Oh, Lord. Your command, your, your, your word, it, it discomforts me. Are you sure you meant what you said? Take that stone away. Look, Lord, you're, you're going to ask me to fill my nostrils with the stench of death in order to serve you? Are you sure, Jesus? You're not mistaken. Of course, death stinks. But the worse the odor, the more the glory Jesus gets. When he strides into that tomb and transforms the darkness to light and the death to life. He's going to take this scene and transform the stench of death into the fragrance of life. Because that's who he is. And that's what he does. He's been dead for days. The timing here is obviously very significant because it's mentioned by John in the account three times. The first time is when we hear that Jesus delayed on purpose out of love for two days. And then in verse 17, when he first gets to Bethany, he discovers he's been in the tomb four days. And now for the third time, we hear Martha say, Lord, he stinketh by now because he's been dead four days. Obviously, this matters. This is a big deal, the timing of all of this. It was common Jewish belief. In fact, it was taught in many of the ancient rabbinical writings, not in the Bible. This did not come from the Bible, but it was so entrenched in their culture that many, many of the Jews, uh, still today I'm told, many of them will believe that the spirit hovers around a corpse for three days. But on day four, he stinketh, so the spirit flieth away. That after four days, decomposition, they, they would try to um, tuck some spices and things in, but after four days, things got ripe. And the spirit would then fly away. So to borrow a phrase from one of the greatest movies of all time, The Princess Bride, Lazarus is dead dead. He's not mostly dead. Lazarus, the point is being made, is dead dead. The only hope now in the typical Jewish way of thinking is the final resurrection day. That's the only thing that can possibly reverse the curse of this corpse. And Martha says that, doesn't she? We heard that last week. Martha says, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So there's hope, but she's saying the only hope is way out there somewhere. Cursed corpse. Death is decay. A cursed cave holding a cursed corpse. But I want to argue maybe even worse than that is the cursed criticism that Martha offers Jesus. It shows her unbelief. Isn't that something? I mean, she just had a really good confession. We, we heard that and saw that last week. She made strong confessional statements about Jesus. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of God who's coming into the world. And she even said back in verse 22, Even now I know whatever you ask of God, God will give you. I guess it didn't occur to her that Jesus might just ask God for Lazarus back from the dead. She clearly does not anticipate this miracle, does she? So she offers some criticism. He stinketh. I don't advise you do that. 
Now we can be quick to judge Martha and we ought not to be. Because it would be the height of presumption, wouldn't it? To just assume Jesus is going to raise your dead brother up right in front of your eyes. I mean, she's presumed rightly, Jesus even hinted at it, that if he were there, he would have just healed his friend and prevented the death. But this would be a step above that in presumption, would it not? And so we probably shouldn't judge her so quickly. It is an interesting thing to me as I've tried to process what, what is going on maybe in Martha's mind. And I don't want to stretch anything too far beyond what the actual words of, of the text say. But it's, it's very likely that Mary and Martha have, they have seen Jesus raise other people from the dead. Or if they didn't see it, if they weren't there, they surely heard about it when he went and raised the widow of Nain's son. Remember this? They're carrying the widow of Nain's son out on, on the, uh, we would call it a coffin, a beer, funeral beer, and Jesus says, stop, raises the guy. Jairus' daughter, she's dead. People are mourning, whether well, professional mourners or they mock Jesus when they say, she's not dead, get, go, get out of here. I got business to do. Little girl, arise. I mean, this is well-known stuff. Even if they weren't there, I think they were probably there because they followed Jesus. He was their Lord. But it would be very presumptuous just to assume that Jesus was going to do this, wouldn't it? But Jesus reminded her, Oh, Martha, plug your nose and open your eyes. Is you're about to see the glory of God. Did I not tell you, Martha, that if you believed, in the Greek it's a third class statement, meaning it's going to happen in the future. It's, it would be said more like this. Martha, did I not tell you that if you believed, and you will, you would see the glory of God. And you will. Her faith is about to grow stronger than she could have ever imagined. She's about to see the glory of God and believe in Jesus in ways she could have not otherwise done. Jesus is going to deepen her faith. Cursed cave, death is dark. Cursed corpse, death is decay. Cursed criticism, death is disbelief. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus can conquer it all. Some of you might notice, some of you who are real careful students of the Bible might have noticed that Jesus didn't actually say anything, at least not recorded by John, about seeing God's glory to Martha yet. He says, I, didn't I tell you? So maybe John just didn't tell us about that particular conversation. But it seems to me more than likely, Jesus mentions, I'm saying what I'm saying right now for the crowd. I, I'm teaching all the disciples. I got the whole crowd in mind with what I'm doing and saying here. And do you remember back in verse 4 what Jesus said this event was all about from day one? When he heard Lazarus was sick, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but it is for the... Oh, there we have it. It's for the glory of God. That the Son of God might be glorified through it. This whole event, Jesus said to his disciples, is about God's glory in me being put on display in and through me, the Son of God. And what could possibly bring God more glory? Martha, than to see the fulfillment before your very eyes of what Jesus just said to you. I am the resurrection and the life. Right here and now. Not I was, not I will be. I am right now, and he's going to prove it right before her very eyes. So she is definitely about to see the glory of God in Jesus Christ in more powerful ways than she could have imagined. God sent Jesus to conquer the curse. That's the point. Don't miss it. God sent Jesus for this. He's the curse conqueror. That's who he is. That's what we're seeing put on display here in the raising 
of Lazarus. Jesus conquers the curse. This cursed canvas that John's painting on is about to explode with a kaleidoscope of colors that glorify Christ the conqueror. That's what's happening here. How does he conquer? Do you see him conquering in this passage? We learn in verses 41 and 42, he conquers the curse by close communion. Do you see it? They take away the stone. The the English translations miss the play on words in the Greek. The Greek says literally, so they lifted up the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes. Oh, I like that. That's instructive. They're busying themselves with the things of the world. Jesus is busying himself with the things of heaven. That's always Jesus' business. As a 12-year-old, he said in the temple, Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? He is 24-7, 365 on mission, doing God's work. He's come down from heaven, and his focus is on heaven. They lift up the stone. He lifts up his eyes and he gives a most interesting prayer, doesn't he? He prays a prayer publicly of thanksgiving. And he thanks God for already answering his prayer in the past. Past tense verbs there. I thank you, Father, that you heard me. And I knew... Or it can be translated, I am knowing, he's in a state, in other words, constantly of knowing, that God always hears him. Wow. So God the Father and God the Son, they already had this thing planned out. The resurrection of Lazarus is a foregone conclusion, you see. That's how God works. Foregone conclusions is what you get with our God. This has already been agreed upon by God the Father and God the Son. But by voicing a public prayer, we are reminded of two very precious truths about who Jesus is. We see, number one, the humility of his humanity, don't we? I mean, why should God, the Son, who created everything by the word of his power, why should he have to pray? He's God. But he's the word become flesh. He's man. And so he walks every moment. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Jesus did it. His very breath was prayer. He walked by praying and being in close, nonstop communion. You always hear me. That's me. I'm always talking. You're always listening. You always honor the Son because why? He's already said in John's Gospel, because the Son always does what's pleasing to you. There's never been a relationship like this before, and it's being put on display for the crowd and for us. But there is a great humility to his humanity. He did this to save our wretched souls. He came so far down that he had to live by prayer like you and me. He makes requests to the Father. The Father grants them. But we also see his dynamic divinity, do we not? I mean, who can say, I know you always hear me. He doesn't mean God is aware of his words. No, I know you always heed. You always listen and respond positively to my prayers. Well, none of us can say that. I guarantee you God hasn't always done everything you've ever prayed. You know why I know that? Because we're all sinful and our prayers are tainted by sin. We ask for wrong things. The Bible says that. We ask amiss. But Jesus never does. So he's putting on display for the crowd and for us his unique, one-of-a-kind, intimate relationship with the Father. And he says so. I am saying this, God, for the benefit of the crowd standing around. 
so that they might believe. What Jesus is doing is intended to generate faith in himself. There are people there who need to be saved and they're going to get saved by this event. And he is galvanizing faith in those who already have it. Do you have a faith in Jesus Christ already? I'm guessing it needs to be galvanized. It needs to be strengthened. It needs some spiritual rebar put through it. Amen? Anybody feeling like you need a better faith? You need a stronger faith? You need a deeper faith? Jesus says, I'm doing what I'm doing. And I'm saying what I'm saying to generate and galvanize faith. Oh, that he might do it even still here. Right here. Today. Christ conquers the curse by close communion. Secondly, we learn in verse 43 that he conquers by a commanding cry. Oh, I like this. Years ago, six, seven years ago, I had a parent no longer in the church. I wouldn't do this if he were. But he asked me, he was an honest question. I'm not trying to be critical, brother. He just, he asked me, why do you shout when you preach? He's like, you're scaring my kids. He's, he said that. I think he was being sincere. He's like, am I supposed to tell your kids, you're, my kids you're mad at them? Now, I'm just going to tell you, my, the flesh in me wanted to answer, I don't know, should I be mad at your kids? How sinful have they been this week? Because I get mad about sin. You should too. Maybe they don't need to be comfortable if they're hearing their sin. But the Holy Spirit helped me, and I didn't say that. I didn't answer him that way. I don't remember exactly my whole answer, but I do remember saying to him, you are, you are incorrect, brother. Because he said Jesus never shouted. That was his argument. You shouldn't shout because Jesus never shouted. And I said, you are very incorrect, brother. The New Testament makes it plain multiple times in multiple places that Jesus most definitely shouted. And this is one of them. He shouted, the text says. This, this verb can be translated, he yelled. He screamed out. He's got a commanding cry to the dead, you see. In the Marine Corps, they taught us to use command voice. Have a voice that commands a little bit of attention where everybody can hear you. You don't want to be unclear when people's lives are on the line. Well, I'm preaching the word of God and I'm telling you your lives are on the line right now. I don't want you to hear my commanding cry because my voice has no power. My words have no power. But I want you to hear again the commanding cry of the cursed conqueror. Oh, can you put yourself there? I often try to think, boy, if I could go back and personally witness one event in the life of Jesus Christ, other than his own resurrection, okay? I mean, I think we'd all say, oh, I'd want to be in that tomb. I'd want to see what in the world happened there. Okay, other than that, have you ever thought about this? What would I want to go see? What would I want to witness personally? Boy, I think it's this for me. So I imagine he walks up to this dank, dark cave and he shouts out, Lazarus, come out. And you can imagine a pin drop. And then you hear a noise in there. And you're already trying to keep from vomiting from the stench. But you hear something and all of a sudden, you start to see movement in there. And he schleps down off of that slab and shuffles out of that tomb, still wrapped up in his grave clothes. And the dead man came out. Don't miss the stunning nature of that short little sentence John puts in there. And the man who had died, he's called this repeatedly in the, if you read, like, he died, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead, dead. Four days dead. 
he came out. And I'm here to tell you, he had to come out. He had to come out. It has been said that Jesus had to call Lazarus by name. Otherwise, all the dead would have come out. If Jesus had merely went to the tomb and said, come out, all the dead would have come out. He's going to do that one day. Getting ahead of myself. He calls Lazarus by name. Well, he just has said in chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. He called Mary. Martha says, hey, the teacher's calling you. What does she do? Gets up and goes straight to him. Mary goes straight to him. Lazarus, straight out of the grave. Calls his own sheep by name and they follow This is a direct fulfillment, by the way, of what Jesus has already said has been entrusted to him by the Father in John 5. Will you turn back to John chapter 5? just want you to be reminded. John 5, verse 25. John 5, 25, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, And hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. He says that's going to happen now, in the here and now. You see, last week we were reminded, Mary and Martha, that's what they missed. They miss that Jesus is right now the resurrection and the life. Oh yeah, they believe that he could do it later, but he's here to prove, no, this is who I am all the time. I'm going to show it to you right here and now. I can give resurrection life right here and now. And then in John 5, he goes on and says, and I'll do it later. Everybody will be raised. There'll be a resurrection of judgment and a resurrection of life. It's being fulfilled before The eyes of this crowd. Can you imagine? His voice reverberates into that cursed cave. And the man who had died came out. Hallelujah. Resurrection life right now. It's still true right now. He still can give resurrection life to you right now. I'm praying he'll call you by name. Remember Peter when Jesus said uh, a lot of his disciples were going away because he was teaching hard things. And he said, will you go away too? And Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have, what did he say? The words of eternal life. I, I think Peter on this day, he had a little bit of galvanizing going on in his faith too like boy did I did I not I spoke better than I knew boy does he ever have the words of eternal life like he speaks and the dead listen the dead dead get up he conquers by commanding cry he conquers finally in verse 44 by a crowning compassion I don't want to make too much of this point at least not yet but it is instructive that Jesus first concern is that his once dead and now alive disciple be freed right away. Unbind him. They didn't mummify the way Egypt did to preserve corpses for long, long, long periods of time, but they did learn techniques in Egypt. They would kind of wrap them up. And so he's got to be, he's got to be freed. Let him go, Jesus says. I think it's, Worth noting, Lazarus doesn't speak. Now, I'm sure he did, um, but even as we keep reading, it's, it's implied that he's speaking, but we don't know. We don't know what he said. He's not allowed to give public testimony. He doesn't write, as one commentator pointed out, any best-selling books, Four Days in Darkness, That's what would happen today. Like everybody has an experience, has got to try to get rich writing a book. Well, Lazarus' book's already been written. It's not about Lazarus. 
Lazarus knows it's not about him. His testimony is the same as mine. And if you're saved, the same as yours. I was dead and Jesus gave me life. That's my testimony. How about yours? Let's keep it simple. I was a dead man. I see both a picture and a prophecy here. And I'll wrap it up for you. This picture is clearly salvation in the here and now, doesn't it? Ephesians 2 says, we were all dead in our trespasses and sins. And we walked according to the course of darkness and the prince of the power of this air. And we were all by nature children of wrath. But Ephesians 2 verse 4 turns a corner and says, but God, being rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, he made us alive together. In Christ Jesus. By grace you have been saved. I was dead. Jesus gave me life. Jesus set me free from the chains of sin and death. He's the curse conqueror you see. Unbind him. Let him go. Jesus said back in John 8. He who commits sin is a slave to sin. But if the son sets you free. You are free indeed. I see a picture here. What is being pictured before our very eyes with Jesus was prefigured in so many ways and in so many times in the Old Testament throughout their history. Let me briefly remind you of some of those. Israel was enslaved in Egypt, but God rescued them with his mighty outstretched arm. He resurrected them as it were, and then he freed them to live in the promised land. That's Genesis through Deuteronomy. Joshua, rather. First five books of the Bible, six. Then they were exiled in Babylon. But God rescued them again and resurrected them. We just recited from Ezekiel 37. And he resurrected them and put his spirit in them that they might be free to live in the land. Ezekiel 16 paints same picture, different words. God says, I saw you, Israel, and you were a stillborn baby wallowing in your blood. Dead. No hope for you. But you know what I did? I scooped you up. Scooped you up out of your blood. And dressed you up and cleaned you up and made you my very bride. And I dressed you and treated you like a princess. And I put you in the land where you can live. In Malachi verses chapters 3 and 4, we see the same cycle. It's just said a different way. The exiles come back. But they begin to sin again, commit idolatry, and spurn their God. But there's a remnant, we're told, at the end of Malachi, who hear the word of God and they repent of their sins. And God promises them the sun is going to rise upon you with healing in its wings. You're going to live in the land. What was prefigured is now pictured in the person and work of Jesus Christ as he stands at the tomb of Lazarus and calls the dead to life. But I see a prophecy here as well. Don't you? Doesn't this point forward to the ultimate resurrection? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you see similarities? And I hope you see, I'm not going to give them to you. I want you to study them on your own. We'll get there eventually as we study through John. But don't you see some similarities and some significant differences in the resurrection of Lazarus and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the ultimate resurrection. It grounds and guarantees all the others. Our resurrection in Christ is grounded and guaranteed because the tomb of Jesus went empty. The curse, you see, is conquered. And the text doesn't specifically mention this, but I can't help thinking, who could have dreamt that Jesus Christ would conquer the curse ultimately by becoming a curse for us. But if you think that curse could hold Jesus down, you are sorely mistaken. Jesus already said back in John 10, I have power to lay my life down and I have power to take it up again. This command, he said, I have received from my Father. 
We serve a risen Savior. He is the curse conqueror because he is the resurrection and the life. And I don't know how in the world we could leave today without reminding ourselves of some great promises of our own resurrection if we too will believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Will you turn to 1 Thessalonians? On towards the end of your New Testament, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I read this at the graveside of our sister Sharon just a few days ago. Verse 13, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. It's a euphemism for God's people when they die. I've already brought that up in past sermons. It's just temporary, just to sleep. Don't grieve, he says, as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again. See, that's the ground. That's the guarantee. Because Jesus died and rose again, even so, though Jesus, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Verse 15, for this we declare to you by a word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a cry of command. There's a loud cry coming again. Everybody's going to hear this one. Everybody's going to hear this cry of command from Jesus. There's a cry of command, a voice of an archangel, and a sound of a trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, who will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort, encourage one another with these words. Oh, you ought to go home and read 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus rose and therefore we will rise and we will put on immortality. And death will on that final day lose its sting. Do you know this Lord, this Savior, the curse conqueror? Years and years and years ago, I was growing up in the 1990s. I, I was grown by the 1990s, but in the 1990s, I really got into Southern gospel music. There was a group named the Bishops. We grew up with the Bishops. We went to school with the Bishops, some of them anyway. Uh, Michelle and I are dying to sing the song for you, but we don't, you know, they, like last time we had anything to do with the song, probably was on an eight track. I don't know. If you're older than 40, you might remember the song. You might, if you knew Southern gospel songs. They had a song, Lazarus, come forth about this event. Maybe I'll send it to you on email, I'll send a link to you, all you young ones who have no idea what I'm talking about. But I love the last stanza of that song. It said, the reason this story gives hope to so many is although we know we must die, our bodies won't stay there in cold and dark silence. We'll hear Jesus cry from on high. Children, come forth, awake like the morning. Arise with new hope, a new life is born. Children, come forth from death now awaken. For Jesus has spoken. Death's chains have been broken. My children, come forth. Will you stand? Lord Jesus, we need you to call out the dead. We have no hope if you don't do this for us. We can't be saved any other way. And we certainly wouldn't have any hope beyond the grave. But because of you, the resurrection and the life, the curse conqueror, we're crying out to you. Save us. Save us, Lord. Raise us from the grave of our sins and give us <laughs> resurrection life. Do the work in hearts and only you can now through the power of your spirit applying your word. Thank you, Jesus, for being our curse conqueror. What have we ever done 
that could merit such life. Thank you.